In the 16th century, the century of the compass, religions collide. Hysteria grips the conquerors of Central America. In Russia, fur becomes the magnet for the biggest land expansion of the century. In Japan, warlords stop centuries of feuding and set out to conquer. In Central Asia, there is culture shock as the Mughals move into Hindu India. And all the stuff of empires flows back to Europe, where it is exhibited in strange collections. A thousand years of history. Millennium. This is Sunday Mass at Santiago Utitlan in Guatemala, a legacy of the 16th century, when the major religions of the world reached out to capture new congregations, and when Christianity was spread by conquest. Part of the service is in Mayan, and it all has a strongly local flavor, which the Catholic Church now welcomes. But it hasn't always been this way. When Catholicism began conquering souls here, one particular tragedy stands out. It happened in the Mexican province of Yucatan. It is the story of Fray Diego de Landa, a story bitterly remembered to this day that takes us back in time over 400 years. Diego de Landa founded and led the Franciscan mission in Yucatan. He and his small band of friars held over a quarter of a million Mayan souls, and all his energies went into baptism. Mayans were baptized after minimal instruction, often by the thousands in a single day. Lander may have foreseen danger in this approach, but without baptism, these people had no hope of salvation. <laughs> and Lander did want to save the Maya. He spent time in the villages, 
learned to speak different dialects and tried to master local customs. His tutor and friend was Chief Nachi Kokom. The Kokom family had once ruled the city of Chichen Itza. Here, Landa learned about feuds so deep that rival dynasties could not unite, even against the Spaniards. Landa was the first European to be initiated into secrets of the Mayan past. Yet however keen he was to record Mayan tradition, Landa was still more zealous to supplant it with Christianity. The fragile balance between Christian and Mayan belief was shattered one day in 1562, when a discovery was made in a cave. Oye, ladra el perros. Pensé que iba a pescar la venado. Vine a ver qué está pasando y me encuentro con esto. Pero qué es esto? ¿Qué significa? Dicen que son los antiguos dioses que ya regresaron. An investigation began into idol worship. Villagers were rounded up and interrogated. When they readily admitted to owning idols and worshipping them to bring rains and good hunting, these were collected. More arrests, more idols. As the net widened, hysteria started to grip the Franciscans. Under torture, the Mayans would admit to anything. Their chiefs and elders were not spared. Over three months, some 4,500 were imprisoned and tortured. When Landa arrived, he did nothing to stop it. The terror culminated in a grand inquisition. In a single night, hundreds were tried, punished and ritually shamed. Their idols were destroyed, their most sacred books burned. Just how widespread idol worship was to the newly converted Maya, or how fragile their new Christian faith can never be known. But they could fuse elements of both beliefs, as still happens today. In Santiago, just a stone's throw from the church, you can see idol worship every day of the year. Don Pedro have San Simon. Novala ka, novala ka, novala diosis, novala santis, novala pusis, novala navastan. Haba i, haba or, haba moment dios. This is Mashimon. He is part Christian, part Mayan idol. Villagers ask his guidance and bring him offerings. Mashimon is particularly partial to cigarettes liquor and neckties. Catholicism here feeds into the Mayan sense of ritual. The church tolerates Mashimon. In Landa's time, there could be no such tolerance. The Spanish settlers in Yucatan feared rebellion if persecution continued. Finally, a new bishop arrived to act as arbiter. 
His name was Francisco Toral. Would he side with Landa or stop the persecution? The stage was set for a showdown. When Toral arrived at the monastery, there was no sign of Landa. He had vanished. When Lander finally did return, he was more than ready to meet his bishop. Prior Provincial Fray Diego de Landa. Su Excelencia. Supongo que la razón de su visita es para dar una explicación de la razón de su salida. Recibí un llamado de la provincia de Sotuta. Se están burlando. Están quemando los crucifijos sacados de los altares. Algunos se han convertido en sacerdotes y han hecho pactos con el diablo. Están ofreciendo víctimas humanas en honor de los demonios, regresando a su pagano pasado. Yo mismo inicié una investigación tomando testimonios de los testigos. But Toral wasn't entirely convinced. These confessions, while chilling, were also convenient in justifying the friar's methods. The bishop sent agents to search out the whereabouts of victims or any proof that the sacrifices had taken place. Nothing conclusive was discovered. The bishop came to doubt the crucifixions. He turned his attentions back to the friars and the deaths in custody. Toral then turned on Landa himself. Fray Diego de Landa, torturó y mató usted a alguna de estas gentes. Nadie murió ni fue malherido por el maltrato. Si algunos recibieron algunos latigazos, estos fueron con moderación. Y si es verdad que algunos murieron por nuestra Inquisición, fue porque nunca creyeron en Cristo ni quisieron dejar abandonados sus ídolos y sus paganismos. Landa was on the retreat. The bishop proclaimed the Mayans blameless in their idol worship, innocent of heresy. Defeated, Landa took his case back to Spain, where eventually he did clear his name. He returned to the Yucatan, ironically, as Toral's successor. To this day, he is vilified here for his betrayal and destruction. But there is another interpretation, one that is not so black and white. As a result of Landa's inquisition, there was a significant shift in the Mayan power structure. The whole scandal of idol worship and sacrifice that tore the region apart seems to have had another agenda. The victims and the informants were on opposite sides of the age-old feuds. Perhaps Diego de Landa, the conqueror of souls, had been the unwitting agent of a Mayan plot. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre.
The most dramatic empire building of the century was in Russia, where the city-state of Moscow expanded over 100-fold into a vast land empire. This is St. Saviour's Cathedral, destroyed by Stalin and now being painstakingly rebuilt. The church has been central to Moscow's power and prestige. Moscow's new status was displayed in one great moment, the coronation of Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, a Tsar of all Russia. This is the Kazansky station in Moscow for destinations south and east. Russia accounts for three-eighths of the world's land mass. To traverse it from east to west takes over a week by train. The huge eastern reach that characterizes Russia was opened up by Ivan. Before him, Russian expansion had always been blocked by Kazan, a Muslim empire to the east. Ivan laid siege to Kazan. When it fell, the way east was finally opened. To commemorate the Kazan victory, St. Basil's Cathedral was built. Its famous cupola domes represent Kazan turbans, one for each chieftain killed in the siege. Legend has it that Ivan had the architects blinded, so they would never be able to surpass this achievement. The church legitimized the Russian Empire. Armies are depicted bearing holy icons into battle. But this was not a genuine crusade. There were no mass conversions. Nevertheless, as you can see, the church did benefit. What came to pay for all this splendor was one thing, fur. Just as gold lured the Spaniards to the Americas, fur was the bait for Russian conquest. In Moscow, the amount of fur you had identified your wealth and rank. And it was fur that put Russia on the international stage, drawing in traders from as far away as China and England. To control fur production meant moving further east to Siberia. Siberia is perhaps the harshest terrain on earth unless you're a furry animal. Ivan did not commit an army here. He relied instead on Cossack mercenaries who moved slowly but surely across the freezing wasteland. They attacked local rulers and terrorized tribespeople, extorting furs and sending them to Moscow. The 
This train of empire helped unhinge Ivan. He trusted no one and set up a new force, the Oprichnina, or Men Apart. They were the agents of an expanding terror state, the first Russian secret police. People were rounded up and executed, skinned alive and fed to the dogs. The Russian Empire hounded its own people, just as it did the tribesmen of Siberia. In the 16th century, Japan joined the nations which tried to found an empire overseas. For nearly 200 years, rival warlords had carved the country into ever smaller slices. The feuding brought fragmentation, anarchy and ruin. But one man finally managed to restore order. His name was Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a peasant soldier known as the Bald Rat. For 387 years, Hideyoshi has been venerated at an annual festival held here amid the holy temples of Nikko. Hideyoshi's portable shrine is paraded around the temple complex by 50 priests. Finally, it is set down in the holiest of temples, where it is presented with offerings. Hideyoshi's achievement was such that he came to be worshipped as the true architect and rebuilder of Japan. In his hands, the nation bloomed for the first time in over a century. There was a new wealth and optimism. Cities teemed with life again. Temples and palaces, ravaged by civil war, were restored and covered with gold. Spectacle was power, and Hideyoshi loved spectacle. This was the period when the tea ceremony evolved as a piece of theatre, designed for Hideyoshi by his closest friend and confidant, Senyo Rikyu. Rikyu was the chief influence on the aesthetics of the age. Gradually, though, Hideyoshi came to view his preeminence with suspicion. In a fit of pique, he ordered his tea master to commit ritual suicide. As power gave way to megalomania, Hideyoshi proclaimed himself master of the world. For the first time in the millennium, Japan looked abroad. My object is to enter China, so that my name be known to its 400 provinces. 
To take this virgin of a country will be as easy as to crush an egg. But a successful invasion depended on a strong maritime base, not easy to secure given the treacherous waters of the Sea of Japan. The imperial plan began with an invasion of Korea. The waters were kind and the invaders reached Seoul in just 20 days. For a moment, Hideyoshi's dream looked like prophecy. But the Korean Navy had developed a secret weapon, the turtle boat. An armored tank on the waves. It blew the Japanese out of the water. Hideyoshi retreated into a mental bunker. His chief concern was now for the future of his dynasty. He had remained childless, and the succession was pinned on his nephew. Then, late in his reign, a concubine bore him a son, Hideyori. Keeping the boy safe from harm became Hideyoshi's obsession. I cannot describe the endless tedium when Hideori is not here with me. I say again, all be vigilant against fire or capture. Each night have someone make the round of rooms two or three times. Do not be negligent in this. The aged ruler was ruthless in securing Hideyori's succession. He ordered his nephew's suicide and massacred the rest of his family. The dream of founding a dynasty took Hideyoshi over. He died in 1598 and his mausoleum is here at the Gadeji Temple in Kyoto. The head priest attends it daily. Hideyoshi's generals, returning defeated from Korea, shattered the succession. His appeals for loyalty to his son went unheeded. Hideyori and his mother took their own lives. And from that point on, with no grand vision, Japan shut out the world and withdrew from the imperial stage for the next 300 years. In 16th century India, Islamic invaders called Mughals turned the subcontinent into an empire by adapting to it. An account still survives written by Gulbadan, daughter of the first Mughal emperor. Gulbadan recalled how India changed her family across three generations. The account took her back to her childhood and beyond. Her family lived in Central Asia and claimed descent from Genghis Khan. Despite this promising inheritance, the Mughal Empire began by accident. Gulbadan's grandfather, Umar Sheikh Mirza was more interested in pigeons than politics. But the Sheikh's hobby proved to be his downfall.
Uma Sheikh Mirza flew with his pigeons and their house and became a falcon who took flight to the other world. The Sheikh was succeeded by his 11-year-old son, Babur. He proved to be an ambitious teenager. Babur laid siege to Samarkand, but thwarted here he turned his attentions east. He overran Kabul and moved into India. Eight campaigns took him across the subcontinent as far as Bengal. Though Babur's life was spent campaigning, the heart of the empire was a five-month journey away in Kabul, where the court and the harem were based. As a strict Muslim, Babur took only four wives, but the harem was filled with concubines, female relations, and the families of nobles who had been killed or imprisoned. There were daughters, mothers, aunts, and servants. It is likely Babur never knew how many women he was responsible for. One day, Gulbadan recalled a special delivery from her father, Babur. It came with the instruction, I send some of the valuable presents and curiosities of Hind, which fell into our hands. Each senior woman is to be given one special dancing girl with one gold plate full of jewels. For the harem women of Kabul, this was culture shock. These Hindi dancing girls were their first experience of a new world. Babur loved India for plunder, not culture. Eight years there only strengthened his identity as a Muslim. When Indian warrior princes combined to attack him, Babur invoked a holy war. For the love of the faith, I became the enemy of pagans and Hindus. I strove to make myself a martyr. Two years after his victory, Babur was dead, from dysentery rather than a call from God. He had conquered much of India, but it remained a foreign land. It was his grandson Akbar the Great who made the Mughals integrate and learn tolerance. India was the center of Akbar's world. The harem helped build the empire. Marriage alliances brought him lands and loyalty. Instead of four wives, it is estimated Akbar had over 800. It was the largest harem in the world. This was to the displeasure of his aunt Gulbadan, who was devoutly Muslim. the emperor was developing alarmingly unorthodox habits. He adopted the dress of a Rajput and became fascinated by Hindi festival and ritual. India's diversity was reflected back in Akbar's image of himself. India was a frontier of religions. Akbar built a special house of worship 
in which all the different creeds were represented. His intention was to preside over ordered discussion, digest arguments from all sides, and build up a truly comparative theology. In reality, it didn't quite work out like that. Often the divines couldn't even agree where to sit. Akbar devised his own religion, which took as much from the Hindu world as from Islam. In his India, there was no persecution. The very qualities for which history extols Akbar the breadth of his thought and his legacy of tolerance were abhorrent to his aunt. In protest, Gulbadan fled to Mecca, the holiest place of Islam. grown on the forehead of an English woman. The passion of Christ carved daintily on a plum stone. The huge boots belonging to the deformed Duke Johann Friedrich II of uh, Saxon Coburg. Flies which glow at night from Virginia, since there is often no day there for over a month. A lock of hair from Petrus Gonsalves, the hairy man from Tenerife. Strange collections were all the rage in 16th century Europe. Explorers and conquerors were shrinking the globe and the spoils ended up here, in cabinets of curiosities. Collecting in this manner was a heroic attempt, in the face of all these novelties, to gather the whole world in a single room. The collections were primarily designed to provoke wonder. An experience the philosopher René Descartes felt was fundamental to the age. I regard wonder as the first of all passions. It has no opposite, for if the object has nothing that surprises us, we consider it without passion. The collectors were either scientists or princes. Emperor Rudolf II in Prague was the greatest and the weirdest. He packed over 20,000 exhibits and specimens from all over the world into just four rooms. Rudolf carefully placed himself at the center of his world in miniature. He was even depicted as master of nature itself. His collection had a political message. It was a place where visiting dignitaries could marvel both at the wonders and at the extent of Rudolf's worldwide reach. 
But the whole enterprise of collecting ultimately had a far loftier purpose. Hmm. This was suggested by Samuel Quicherberg, Europe's top collection advisor. The ideal collection should be nothing less than a theatre of the universe. The exhibits, if properly designed, act as keys which unlock the whole of human knowledge. The full script of man and his maker. If this smacked of magic, of Faustian pacts with the devil to gain knowledge of all things, Quickerberg was quick to point out the proper Christian credentials of such an enterprise. In making a theatre of the universe, the higher purpose, of course, is to honour God's sublime creation, to show his miracles in every facet. God's hand was indeed evident in exhibits from the natural world, minerals with magical properties, prodigious animals that were like works of art. This was nature stretched to the limits of creativity. But man could be God's rival in the fashioning of extraordinary objects. God, it seemed, was no longer the only creator. Holy relics and natural magic shared shelf space with new science. The collections often became laboratories for experiments that fused science and magic. One that survived is Rudolf II's recipe for a plague remedy. Desiccated toads and pulverized chickens, the menstrual blood of a young maiden, white arsenic, pearls and emeralds from the Orient. This concoction is to be baked into a toad cake and then worn next to the heart in an amulet. The age of the marvellous was drawing to a close. With trade and traffic around the globe, these objects lost their power to excite wonder. The idea that the whole world might be stored as data in a single room is only now becoming believable again. <laughs> <laughs> 